Well, welcome back to uh, another episode of uh, Poets in Montana. I'm Mark Gibbons, and uh, today my guest is a uh, longtime poet uh, in Montana, John Holbrook. Uh, you know, and I, I to, to, it's like, kind of like the last one of these I did with a, a couple of old Montana poets. Uh, it's hard to get it all in. He's got a ton of stuff uh, over the years to share with us, and we want to have a conversation or two. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about books published and all that. But John came from Michigan. You landed out here in the mid-60s, right? 66. 66. And with the, uh, I mean, to go to school? Yes. All right, so you were accepted to... To go the... to graduate school in, in English. Right. Had never heard of Hugo when I got here. Right. And he'd only been here for a couple of years. That's right, yeah. yeah like right. a year or two before. Right. I took one class from him, and I switched from my major, which was uh, uh, English literature, okay. to creative writing. All right. And here we are. Yeah, yeah. So, so you were, uh, were you doing a lot of writing on your own prior to that? Uh, a little stuff? bit. I started back in Michigan and probably, oh, 50, 59, 60, uh, right, right out of high school. And the Oakland University College I went to I had a magazine, and, and so I wrote a couple of poems. By God, they took them. They, planned, you know, blew me away. Yeah, yeah. You know, maybe and, you're uh, a poet. <laughs> maybe I'm a poet, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. cool. Uh, I, you know, one of the things I, I know I mean, that uh, you've been, you know, you, you, like the first time I met you was at the Garden City Reading mm -hmm. Series that you used to host. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and that was a wonderful series, and you were involved with, uh, well, Roger Dunsmore and Pat Todd, mm -hmm. Ed Leahy, uh, uh, and, uh, and Dave Thomas. Right. Anybody else in there that I'm missing? But um, I think Robert Lee was somehow involved in that. Um, mm -hmm. But, but that, so yeah, that, that, was, that was the core. Yeah, and, that was back in the early 90s, and that's, that's how we met. And, uh, and then I moved down here in the late 90s, uh -huh. and, and we have uh, crossed paths and swapped poems for quite some time. At a this long point. time. One of the things I noticed, you know, when I kind of glanced at your bio, because I mean, I, you know, you don't think about these things until you get in situations like this, <laughs> but uh, I noticed that uh, we have a whole hell of a lot in common, actually, kind of. Good. Y you know what I mean? In terms of... Uh, just how we kind of came into this and then how we've supported ourselves. And mm -hmm. you also worked uh, in the schools with kids, right? I did. I was um, a second year of Montana Arts Council's um, Poetry in the Schools program. Um, what year was that? 71, 72. Okay. I think Jim Welsh started it in 71 and, and he, he did it one year and then um, he did other things. Yeah. Wrote more poems, wrote more books. Exactly. And, um, I had and so I him. took off and was uh, one end of the state and the other. I remember one time being in Plentywood and I had to drive like hell to get over to Libby yeah. for the next week and on it went. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So that was when it started. And you say 71, like you're thinking like the spring maybe? Because I, I was all, I've been, because I see, I had Welch when I was in high school in that program. Oh, that he was came the first year. Yeah. yeah, and I thought it was like the fall of 70. I've been saying been. 70 yeah. all this time, but anyway. That's foggy, but yeah. it could have been yeah, 71 yeah, yeah. or 72, but. Well, very cool. I mean, that's, that's uh, uh, I think that's one of the things that, uh, one of our, more prouder accomplishments, probably. Yes. What we've yes. done for the young you know, people the, in this state by just bringing poetry to them. You know? I got an interesting um, email from a former student. Um, uh, I think it was from Powder River School, uh, Ken Briggs. And he just wrote me out of the blue. Mm -hmm. And he had dug up some of my books and some of the poems. Mm -hmm. uh, and he said, uh, while he didn't, travel down that path that I had started to spark. You know, one right. kid, 1972, right. just wrote me uh, just two recently? days ago. Oh, wow. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, when I was interviewing Roger, he was talking about somebody that contacted him out of the blue 
uh, based on an encounter in a poem he wrote for him in 1967. Wow. Like, Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a head trip. Yeah. Well, John, why don't we kick this off with sharing a poem? Okay. Share, re read something for us. Read right. a couple or whatever you want to do here to get started. All right. I'm going to have a glass of water here. There you Sip. go. Okay, I thought I'd start uh, a poem called Ice Barn. It's a childhood poem. Uh, you have these experiences um, that you never forget. And uh, in the upper portion of the Lower Peninsula of Michigan, back in the, the 50s, the 60s, um, my father and a bunch of his friends built a cabin. And uh, near that cabin, um, around this lake, was, uh, was an old barn that had been converted into a, to an ice barn. Oh, yeah. And so they saw these huge blocks of ice out of the, the lake and hauled them uphill and put them into the barn and covered them with sawdust. And they were stacked to the rafters. They were big as refrigerators, Wow! some of that ice. And right. so I wrote this poem to try to recapture that experience. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's called Ice Barn in three parts. One. On the back side of a gentle rise, sloping into wild flower lake, an old barn looms among the hills and pines, huge as a cathedral. Around the rim of a rotting water trough, hundreds of swallows perch with tucked wings, nodding and bobbing before ascending into clouds of tantalizing bugs. Grandpa leans into solid oak, Massive doors swinging open to vast stores of ice, blocks big as freezers, quarried like stone, stacked to the rafters. Fierce winter storms, cloaked in blankets of damp golden sawdust, conspiring in chill silence, trapped to their last breath, cool their heels here. Steam from our breathing rises and near stained glass shafts of sunlight squeezed through cracks in the roof. Outside, July tries to hammer in its heat. Planks of pine, slab oak, soak up sound. Odors of wool, camphor, linger on walls where men hung heavy coats on wooden pegs. Hand-forged tongs hang from block and tackle, tracking iron rails suspended far overhead. My father's father said, some of this ice would last a whole year. Two, that summer in Detroit, I woke to the clip-clop of hooves on brick-paved streets, bottles rocking, clinking against themselves in wooden crates. The milkman chiseled ice, scooped buckets of flakes, spilling some, treating me with chunks. Lumps of sugar on my palm crumbled in the horse's mouth. Three. Grandma's pedal stitched, navy wool knickers itched as I patrolled the boulevard, pirate patched, an apple crate slapped for a sword, one eye keen to a vaulted barn's icy legions. Ten soldier tails Grandpa whipped up wound me down slowly like his brakeman's watch, merciful winds rustling my window shades, old bristle chin bending low, tucking me in. A host of kings that summer rumbled in towering thunderheads, glints of lightning glancing off their armored steeds and burnished shields. An evening's fury spent, they'd ride on toward morning, Bits and bridles jingling like money in an old man's pocket. Come sunrise, wet coins of rain, everywhere light fell, down and down my sunleaf street. Nice. Thank you. That's nice. And that's uh, what we had, our milk delivered. Right. Every other day, you could hear them coming. I'd run out there. It was only two or three, mm -hmm. you know. Right. And I don't know if you ever wore knickers when you were a kid. They were probably out of... <laughs> no, no. Not me. Uh, <laughs> but my Uncle Eddie had come back from the Navy, and so Grandma had uh, 
confiscated his uniform and turned them into knickers for me. And they itch like hell. <laughs> wool pants. Yeah, yeah, yeah wool pants. Yeah. Middle of summer. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's a great. That, those are great images. Uh, and, and, and of course, you, we all, we bring ourselves to everything, and, and, and that ice business reminded me of the stories my dad told. He, he delivered ice, you know, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, just a little bit before that. What, what did they use those massive, big, huge blocks for? Uh, well, they broke them up. They, they cut them up in the, in the smaller, smaller chunks, and, sure. and they hauled them down to Detroit and Flint and other places for creameries. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and um, Shave ice. Yeah, and, yeah. and for... Um, meat lockers and stuff like that. Right. So, yeah. I mean, nope. they had refrigeration, but in some instances, and to keep the beer cold at Tiger Stadium, probably. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Yeah, that's a good poem, man. Thank you. I kind of hoped you were going to start with that. Uh, you know, I knew it was the first poem in that book, and I thought, oh, I hope he starts with this. <clears throat> oh, look good. Yeah. So you want to do another one right, be, right behind it? I would do so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll read one about my grandfather. There you go. His name was Elias. He was from southern Illinois. In his time, he had been a coal miner and a farmer. Uh, and then he moved up to Detroit and started working in a foundry and shoveling coal. <laughs> <laughs> and he built a house that he lived in, and my dad was born in, uh, by himself, like a three-story house. Wow. Yeah, it's still there. Um, okay. Elias. Making a fist, or having made one, trying to let it go, Parkinson's disease. Grandpa gives his all he had so easy once, rocking now just so tall in his sawbuck chair and woolly bones. Strap of a man when moving west meant moving west, or someplace all of the same, swallowed up by snow. Grandpa packed a family north, settled for a foundry, a scoop shovel wage and flat cars full of southern coal. He seasoned then as tests of strength were all but news, built himself a dandy house, fixtures of brass, hardwood floors, a spanking monarch stove. Their good life never loosened Grandma's obsessions, though. For years she embraced one Christian sect after another, finally abiding with the scientists' prayer to battle diabetes, and as God came calling, all their suffering, suffering came to mean heaven, sins forgiven, home forever, her epitaph on mortal stone. So we let her room for rent, moved downstairs, fancied a second wife, a social gal, practiced his chin-ups five at a time, not once, but twice in a row, stropped the finest steel, whipped the lather up, shaved a steady straight razor blade, mitered, dovetailed cabinet work, clipped hair on barber's silk, a wife's quilts and applique, set the pace, spiced meager pensions up with fun. And though not exactly sold on this, he had to let her go, hard at first, then slow all of her from his empty arms, and he cried when friends opened theirs. For heat he burned coal, clinkers scattering a garden path to the backyard plum, where he'd sit to trim a craggy toe, smoke or snooze. And his chair moves, same as the day his fist never lost its grip or opened up for air. Nice. Thank you. Nice portrait. Nice tribute. Uh, let me have another to drink Grandpa. Water. He was great. He, um, he fixed um, old wind up clocks and he had a, a living room and a dining room that just lined with them. Right. You, you, it was just beautiful. They were, you know, a lot of them were hand carved. Yeah. And do you think we would get any when he died? No, oh, somebody got in there and got them all. <laughs> yeah. yeah, excuse me. I'm going to fall out of this chair here in a minute. Um, so let's see what else we got in here. 
Now here's a, a poem from my father called Clearwater on the Swan. And um, when I came out here from Michigan, one of the reasons I came to Montana was to go fishing, <laughs> you know. Uh, because up there in, in Atlanta and Onaway, Michigan, uh, we went walking in the woods and there was a small stream running through there. And um, he said, we got to creep up close to the bank and then just step on it a little bit. And sure enough, all these brook trout fled out from under there and I was hooked. Yeah. And I had to get back to that kind of water, which, you know. Right. We don't have brook trout like that here, but right. we got bigger fish. Right. So, clear water on the Swan. This is the Swan River up in the Swan Valley. A man like himself, a man on the swan takes trout like himself by the teeth. A native cut release keeps the strain abundant and rash. He says, the sun makes his mornings, not a sack filled with fish. He's, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. He wades in, fixed on the glare, the drum skin of my canvas craft, strong drift in the air. He signals away up the river. Other men come to an end. As extemporaneous as vegetables and pails, they have no flair for the sun unless it meets them halfway through sheets of glass onto a sill, somewhat diminished. Behind a window facing a road, though, fears for them grow. Always a river. And now age moves me twist my arm like wire. The back of my mind is just right. The slack in my line, nice and easy. I take my cues from those with the sun slung over their backs, one foot on sand and one on the river. It shows, Father, the sun, and I'm up to my neck, I know. This morning I live and you are dead. I wait in our harm like this water, and for any child at hand, I thank our stars. I set the hook, my teeth, and thrive like the sky, my song, your old familiar hum. Nice. And that, and that was from uh, Clearwater on the Swan, which was your, your first book, right? Yeah, yeah. I think I used it in both books. Yeah, yeah, I, good, I, yeah. You know, I mean, why not? I mean, this is kind of a collected, almost, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, right. This yeah. one that from Foothills. Yeah. You want to read another fishing poem? Sure. Why don't you read this one? Okay. <laughs> I think it's a little sonnet. It's dog-eared there somewhere. Yeah, oh, there it is. Yeah. It's called Sonnet on Rock Creek. I used to fish Rock Creek a lot. Um, and then my uh, back sign, it kind of gave me trouble and I found my footing on those slippery rocks just too much to ask for. <laughs> so I went to the Locksaw over in Idaho and um, tried to avoid those kind of boulders. Sonnet on Rock Creek. Now, many of you will know if you've gone up the road, you'll recognize some of these um, places along here. First Bridge, Valley of the Moon, good old spruce bud moth, light Cahill, false cast, forearm drop, flip and roll, great toss, and outright nasty brown digs and poles. Ranch Creek, golden stones, bucktail caddis, bank brush, a thundering gun and run rainbow. Mergan mergansers scattering in the flow. A little sooty oozel bobs and dips. Status hardly matters in postcard water. The baddest, meanest damn bull trout you ever saw patrols the dowels hook jawed. Cabin Creek, little hogback, rooter flats, browns and cutthroat plow upstream each fall Dance over gravel beds. It's the law. Nice. Dance into mm. the sonnet form. And, and, you know, I mean, maybe that doesn't, uh, it's, it's wonderful language, and so it's a great poem for anybody, but particularly if, if you've done a little fishing, 
It's a fun poem to read. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the Big Sky Journal has this right now, and they're they're trying to look for photographs for it. Yeah, cool. So it's been a year, so that's pretty good. Um, one more. Sure. Okay. This is about fishing the Big Hole River, um, which, believe it or not, uh, has grayling in it, and the grayling were left over from the last ice age. They mm -hmm. got trapped when the glaciers receded. Um, and so they're living in the big hole. And there might be some other streams in Montana, but I can't think of them now. But they are beautiful fish. High elevation. Yeah, yeah. Fishing the big hole river. The trick fishing for lunkers, this side of the continental divide on a stretch of the big hole river from Glen to Twin Bridges, has little to do with incredible graphite or a tailored six-pound tippet. Flip your streamer up and across, stripping line off in a dead drift, back slow then, and hand rolls, now and again with a short twitch, your marabou muddler like this just under the surface, every inch a sculpin. When evening winds rise and the sun stacks up on top of the hills, you'll tie a blood, light, a blood knot on the line between you and the world. No sense. The brute, the current, cuts loose in pursuit of its life, knifes the air once and again with such twists. You know this is it, where you stand. And where you step is hard, hard because you stand straight, balancing grace at each end. Though a sure night held, a light grip cushioned each lunge, Tempered steel, barbed bone, snapped and let go. <laughs> <laughs> the one that got away. The one that got away. Yeah, yeah. Nice, nice fishing language. Thank you. Um, I've got one more request from from. Uh, Okay. From that book, I mean, if, if you're going to dig into those guys now, no, how that's about, fine. That's you know, fine. No, 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 not this one, but uh, this one. Or that yeah, one? I mean the 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 Royal Oak. Uh, okay. The clear blue sky, the Royal Oak. Uh, the uh, the one uh, the guy. Oh my! It's a, it's a totally it's a different departure, right, from where we've been oh, at this point. Oh, are the, you? Uh, the Eddie's Club. Uh, uh, oh. The movie. The guy going to the movie. Okay. You know, that guy. My only Ed, only Eddie's Club poem. Well, and what's it called? It's called Christmas Eve at Eddie's Club. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Call it a party. Christmas coming through the trim dead air. Menthol was what we wanted. The bright blue ashes of any outrageous promise and no more malignities, just spring. For a starter, we polished off the table. Dandies for a second round, a charitable moment. We drained our mugs to names we'd like to trust. Johnson, McNamara, Nixon, Kissinger, Mitchell, Haldeman, Ehrlichman, Haig, Westmoreland, Hoover. Short of change, yum yum yalmer, woolly sheep herder, bean and salt, pork man, six months in the hills, his home, a shepherd's wagon, cradled in the Cascade Range, stumbles on her game, bums a beer. Elizabeth, somebody or other, raven-haired beauty, perky melons lifting, falling on her Texas breath, coos under a hot tin roof. She reels through his body like a movie. A half world away, at the Vietnam village of My Lay, Lieutenant William Calley and platoon lock and load, then unload on every man, woman, and child, leaving 500 corpses rotting where they fall. Back stateside in nearly as short a span, anyone equally worth a damn likewise as summarily as well gunned down. Medgar Evers, Malcolm X, John and Bobby, Schwerner, Goodman, Cheney, Martin Luther King. Later, last showing at the Buck and Night Roxy, 
open door alley light glinting through a slit in the screen, rowdies wobbling the front row seats. Yum Yum sidles in, fluffs his coat, dodgers up contraband beer. He pops a Great Falls Select, knuckle suds running his chin, nods, sympathizes the sad character Paul Newman is. Suddenly, an eye-searing blast of beer and grease from Oxford Cafe after dinner gas punctuates the dark. The name Ellsberg pops out. God damn it, he shouts, Ellsberg's a name to trust. Yum yum. Yum yum yummer. Yeah. Yum yum. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's a great that's a great journey. And you know, it uh it uh, it reminds some of us, you know, of uh, the past. Yes. I mean, it didn't take a few names to bring back uh where we've been mm -hmm. and what we've been through that over the years, you know, and I I just I'm talking about we as in a, as in a nation yes. and a people. And, uh, and, of course, I think that has relevance now more than it did in a while, mm -hmm. given our situation. Yeah. Um, well, in those days, people our age were, were being uh, inducted. Yeah. And they were going over, and uh, um, many of us uh, got that student deferment card as long as we could, mm -hmm. you know. Right. So I got as close to going in as driving um, on a bus with a bunch of other semi-recruits who were heading towards Butte for our physicals, yeah. uh, including one fellow who had already been in the Army for six years or seven or eight years. He couldn't understand why he wanted them again. He hated it. You know? <laughs> but there he was. Huh. Yeah. So. Yeah. Those are strange times. But... Uh, you you have some newer stuff you want to share with sure, us? Sure, that would be good. Okay, here's a poem I wrote last summer during the eclipse. Mm -hmm. And um, um, my wife and uh, son and his girlfriend headed over to Idaho because they would get another 10 minutes of, you know, the... Um, performance up there yeah dave, dave went down there with uh with his buddy tim and oh right who else they drove down for yeah too. uh but i went to the pause up ranch back on that sunset hill road yeah and um got out of the car and there was one other car there some uh, students from the university and um it was really interesting mm -hmm. because as the as the, the dimming happened Things slowed down. I mean, animals slowed down. The uh, domestic cattle started bedding down. And um, the buffalo and the wagyu, which is an, this monstrous black beer-drinking cattle from Japan, <laughs> heavily marbled. But, uh, you know, anyway, yeah, and he's, he didn't care about it. So um, I just observed what was going on and, and ended up with this poem entitled Eclipse on Sunset Hill Road. Though noon, the days backing down the way morning came, everywhere a dimming, where pastures soften, domestic herds are bedding down. As the sunlight weakens, my shadow shelters behind me, melting away. The land settles down, grows quiet, and the earth listens. Bluebird fledgings huddle on a fence post, feathers fluffed, puffed out. A flicker lands on top of a nearby pine, frowns, glares at the countryside. I nudge a grasshopper where I stand. It refuses to move. In a stillness like no other, a total solar eclipse slips into place and the sun breathes easy among the vastness of other stars, and the earth sighs. Yeah. Well, like you had uh, shoulder surgery, and, and I had shoulder shoulder surgery, <laughs> yeah. and and we, you know, and we get to go to our uh, physical therapists, and uh, so. 
Uh, this song is based on an experience that she had taking her two-year-old down to Atlanta, and she told me about it. And uh, so it turned itself into a poem. Um, the kid had never flown before. There you go. But uh, he had a good time. It's called Flight Song. Second time in a big jet, the kid wants the window seat for the ride home. The monster rocket plane roars off down the runway, pinning him back against the seat. He can hardly budge, which makes him laugh. Changing directions a little after liftoff, the plane seems to slip somehow, right itself, then bank back to the left, its huge silver wing one blinding reflection of morning sunlight. And just outside the kid's window, the huge jet passes directly over the interstate, cars and trucks going about their business in slow motion like traffic below. As the plane rights itself and settles into a routine flight towards Salt Lake and beyond, a flight atten attendant regains her composure, releases her grip in the back of a passenger seat, acknowledges concerns she sees with a nod, a smile, a few quiet sighs of her own. Under all the sky, the planet spins on like a top, and everywhere the kids keen to infinite possibilities of play. And when he blurts out, Mom, Dad, look, there's toys down there. Damn if some of us aren't looking to. <laughs> a herd poem. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> there you one. go. Um, this next poem is called King Cutting Loose. Uh, and I wrote it after I read an article in Scientific American by a guy named Jesse Baring. Um, um, and in the article, he had um, talked about um, an ape and gorilla rehabilitation facility in Miami that he worked in and relating to how this, this gorilla at one particular time um, reacted to what he had done. And um, it also points to uh, the fact that it was my first indication that um, some animals are just self-aware. Mm -hmm. And we don't give them credit for that. But uh, what happened there uh, in this gorilla cage with this young man, uh, to me, it just spoke loudly of that. And <clears throat> it's called King which was the name of this gorilla. Mm -hmm. King Cutting Loose. Imagine a 450-pound, 27-year-old western lowland gorilla with troublesome calcified gums, having his toes routinely, routinely massaged by his keeper. Imagine his excitement upon hearing the keeper beginning his rounds and his not-so-subtle enticement for all to see by sticking his whomping stomper through the bars of his cage, hoping this friend coming his way might perk up his plump little piggies. And Jesse Baring, author, aspiring scientist, scientist, 20 at the time, in an act of reverence for those mighty digits, pushing protocol out the window, bows, drops to one knee, takes hold of the biggest, giving it a palpable squeeze, and then abruptly, out of the blue, flashes a great big toothy grin as if that plump digit in his grip was nothing if not standard fare on a zookeeper's menu. King, as he was known, burst into a thundering jungle giggle at being so easily taken in. If you've never seen a gorilla laughing at his gorilla self, you haven't lived, Jesse says without saying. Oh, how King enjoyed the deal, chortling around like a mountain on the move, like a house of fire, in a flash. Oops, here we go. 
In a flash, the bars of his cage melting away, the wild breeze of a good laugh catching them both by surprise. <laughs> I remember we lived in California in 48 through 50. Uh, we went to the San Diego Zoo and there was, um, there was no glass wall, it was just the gorilla and in his cage or out and um, he didn't like people. Yeah. And if he defecated, he'd pick it up and throw it at him. <laughs> <laughs> and I saw him, but he wasn't throwing that day. So. <laughs> um, did, uh, did you see that, that uh, well, you know, Betty White recently passed oh, away. Yeah. And whatnot. Did you see that footage of her? with Because she was an animal rights right, yeah, you know, yeah. enthusiast or person, supporter. And she was, was with this gorilla in this one movie. Uh, and it reminded me of a lot of the footage from, mm -hmm. like Jane Goodall and. Yeah, I Diane can't remember Boston. the name of that gorilla, but it 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 um, it had a vocabulary of over three hundred words. Yeah, yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, here's a magpie poem. There you go. Uh, we know those. <laughs> they're all over, but uh, they're corvids and they're really smart oh, yeah. and smart asses too. Oh yeah. Yeah. Among magpies, I've read where a birder happened upon a wildlife event he had never heard of or could imagine might even take place. On a recent trip afield, he came across the body of a magpie, and judging by its intact form, feather sheen, lack of odor, a recent loss. It lay on its side in a mat of leaves and needles shed from nearby ponderosas and aspens. Absent among the converging corvids were their usual excitable greetings, commodious limb hopping chatters and hellos. Rather, they settled down on limbs overlooking the comprehensible sight of a loss of one of their own lying below. Soon the magpies dropped to the ground, one by one, each to spend a moment with the fallen. The body was gently pecked at, a feather soothed down, stroked back in place. The birder observed more than a few placing snippets of grass or sticks to one side of the body or the other. With only the soft, concussive lifting of wings cutting through the silence, these common, surprisingly gifted, often annoyingly raucous rascals of our skies sat through each visit attentively. The birder noted the ceremony ended when, the last bird back in place, the flock rose in an iridescent whirr of flickering tails, directionless at first, but then, as some headed off alone, others left together, chatter returning the further they flew. With the fallen bird's run of luck behind them, their tribal moment embraced, tucked under wing for good keeping, they'd taken their grit beyond the conceits of men, some of whom, charged with their own measure of flair, nothing better to do, might just lob a shot or two their direction before ever conceding to a flock of silly birds, such passions for life and lament. Pests. Yes. Yeah, uh, it reminds me of uh, one that I recently, I talked to uh, Greg Keeler recently in one of these. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. and, and he, had, uh, he had a couple of different uh, Magpie really? poems and and human magpie relations. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Was it? A, it was a full adult magpie too. It sounds kind of sounds like you know. Mm -hmm. It sounds real ceremonial. It's, it's interesting. Well, yeah, it was a, almost very, a service. You know. Yeah. Very observant. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. These poems are. I mean. I, yeah. Well, that's. <clears throat> I think that's what makes poets. Yeah. Who, 
what they are is because um, we're blessed with uh, an ability to see things other people don't see. Yeah, and or hear I, them, and, and well, and and they're and they're they're focused. They're 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 you know they're really looking at something, and so it only happens in a in a shorter period of time. Mm -hmm. There's a, uh, a photographer that, that works with uh, students up on the on the reservation, Flathead Reservation, just north of us. David Spear, you know, you mm, met yeah, David? I know, yeah. yeah, yeah. Anyway, I worked with him a couple of different times with you know because he had a whole bunch of uh, portable like uh, cameras, 35 millimeter cameras that shot like uh, Polaroid film type. Oh, wow. And yeah. so we could take them out and they could shoot pictures all over and then they'd write about things, you know, with mm -hmm. me and we could put poems beside still photographs. I think that's a great, they complement each other. You bet a it lot. is. Yeah. Photography, you're a photographer. Yeah. Photography and poetry, Yeah. they're a good yeah. marriage, you know, yeah. observers. Yeah. And one thing I learned about photography, and every once in a while in, in good magazines, you'll, you'll see um, a photo that is taken from this level, mm -hmm. down on the ground. Mm -hmm. So you get the gravel, you get the road, and you, and you get everything on the side, and then the mountains in the background, then the clouds. I mean, it's, right. it's not too hard to think that, but most people just point it right there, right. you know, and put a tree right in the middle of the photograph. Yeah. And shoot, shoot a picture. <clears throat> well, here's a portrait. Uh, it's for my mother. And I'm looking at the last photograph I have of her. Portrait. You are gone now. And I am looking at the last photo I have of you. Of all your recent photos, this one unquestionably is the best. Despite angina, there is regard in your face reaching beyond your years of suffering. I want to rest my head against yours. Let the soft strength of your small hands work the back of my neck and shoulders. But you are nudging me back saying it's only human. No one's strength lasts forever. Of such a single courage, peaceful and whole, I want to thank you for your carrying these leers. I've lived away. In your repose, I see the roads I've chosen are more traveled and narrow, more embraced than abandoned. No matter the headwinds, buffeting one's direction, quagmires and potholes, stumbles and starts, graveling my windshield. This is my road, grown out of yours, the way paved with intention, tempered with warmth and dimension. Yeah. Nice. Thank you. You know, it, Life, uh, obviously, if we're lucky enough to live into our 80s, ninth decade, 90s, <laughs> you're starting your ninth decade. I mean, it's only nine years for me, and I turn 81 here in another yeah. month. So, yeah. how long does your mom live? 85, I think. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'll, you know, all of a sudden, you, because because there, you you never, in, as a young person, you never envision. I mean, your relationship. Changes exactly. so dramatically. Yeah. The, old, the older you get, and then you, sometimes you catch up, and sometimes you pass them if they pass on a little bit earlier. Well, you know, I've, I'm kind of a, a perennial delinquent. <laughs> I'm, I'm still a kid, you know. Yeah. I, yeah. I still have curiosity that gets me in trouble, gets me up on places I shouldn't be at my age. Oh yeah. Exploring and looking for things. Right. Um, and I don't see that a lot in other older people. Yeah, I, well, I mean, I, 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 my mother was that way, you know. I mean, that's that's the way she was. She uh -huh. was like that. And, yeah, and, yeah, you know. And I remember her telling uh, other people, hearing her talking to other people, uh, like my kids, or uh, about you know what it was like to be. And she was just, just, she was just baffled. It was just, it's just too goddamn weird <laughs> to be stuck in this body, uh -huh. this decaying yeah. piece of mess. When I'm, you know, the same sort of mentally. Mm. 19 year old 
woman or whatever she was inside of her head, whatever that magic year it is that we kind of carry around with us. But I mean, it goes back to being a kid. Nobody ever really changes too much. You no, do. No, no. You, you, you obviously go through changes, you learn things, but you're pretty much yeah. the same way you were. Yeah. <laughs> and if you're kid. excited about being alive and learning, yeah. you know, you've, you're a step ahead. Oh yeah, and, and you're 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 gonna you're gonna you're gonna do things. You're gonna make things. You're gonna you're gonna find ways to entertain yourself. Indeed, indeed, like indeed. that. Yeah. Um, <coughs> what time is it? Oh, I think we've got we've about got, ten minutes. We've been going about forty-seven minutes. Okay. Okay. Um, Oh, about a year ago, uh, I was looking through some old life magazines. And one of them was from 1946, January 7th, 1946. It only cost 10 cents. <laughs> yeah. And it was big. Uh, and it had all these stories and all these photos in it. Um, and I, I wrote this poem about the oldest man in America. There's a short little story about this black man who was born on a, on a as a slave and um, survived that and farmed and worked in the fields. He worked for a hundred years straight, a hundred years, and he laid his gloves down finally. Wow. And How old was he? He lived to be 120. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so at 100, he stopped farming and immediately started preaching. He took, he you know, walked around and he had to quit that on 117. Then he spent the last three years of his life reading his Bible. But it, it's just an interesting huh. kind of heartwarming story. To any man that would spend that amount of time and not complain about it, <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> We well, might have complained at six, once or twice. Yeah, at 69, <laughs> he had his first kid. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. let me, his, I call it his depth, the debt we owe him. On the cover of a January 7th, 1946, 10 cent issue of Life magazine, stogie mouth Winston Churchill, speckles slipping in his nose, paintbrush in hand, points to an oil painting he's working on in his home studio at Cartwell in Kent, England. A portfolio of color re reproductions of his graced seven pages later on in the magazine's interior. And a critic allows that technically his paintings, though not the equal of his statementship, are pervaded by the same dogged spirit, uh, same spirit of dogged realism. Elsewhere in the issue, Bell Telephone is busy installing over two million miles of long-distant cables. Shockingly, pages later, General Patton has laid the rest after having been killed in a tragic uh, tra traffic accident. Everywhere vibrant ads appeared extolling the virtues of good laxatives, hair tonic, Mott's apple juice, smart kitchenware, and cigarettes where 25 million homeless people are milling around Europe in the middle of winter, and where in Warsaw, another million people are living in holes in the ground, and where no one can think beyond the need for food for a day because money is useless, useless because the only viable currency on the street is a cigarette, and whereas camels are the brand most favored by smiling physicians, Jim Wilson, oldest man in America, prefers his favorite pipe. Born on May 15, 1825 in slave quarters on a plantation in southeastern Georgia, nine days before Queen Victoria's sixth birthday, and in the third month of John Quincy Adams' term as the sixth president of the United States, Jim Wilson learns he is the oldest man in America when he walks into a Vidalia, Georgia County Welfare Office to see if he qualifies for a pension. 
The Census Bureau verifies the date of his birth, awarding him his pension. Until he was 117 years of age, he had never visited a doctor or taken any medicine. But it took a fall and a broken hip for him to finally do so. A white doctor, though, a Mr. C.W. Finley from Vidalia as well, checked his vital signs and found that Mr. Wilson was in perfect health for a man half his age. His blood pressure read 155 over 80, which is high by today's standard. But the doctor noted Jim's pulse was strong and regular. Mr. Wilson stood five foot nine inches in height and weighed a trim 150 pounds. The doctor noted that his skin was clean and pliant, that his vision and hearing excelled beyond his years. Notably, he also recorded that Mr. Wilson was a good reader and that when speaking, he never used Negro idioms. He ate what he wanted, lean meats, eggs, cheese, butter on his biscuits, and fresh milk straight from the barn. His only questionable habit, of course, was smoking. Continuous clouds of smoke billowing from his favorite pipe wherever he walked or worked. The year 1925 marked 100 years in a row that he worked as a farmhand, first as a slave, then as a free man. At the age of 49, he became a father for the first time and then six more times after that. At the end of 100 years of age, he laid his farm gloves, gloves down for good, then, without missing a beat, took up preaching as an ordained Baptist minister. Giving up the pulpit at 117 years of age, he took to reading his Bible daily the last three years of his life. Life magazine stated that 500 people with at least 100 white 100 white people, had gathered to help Mr. Wilson celebrate his birthday. His many friends and neighbors offered him gifts and dozens of assorted presents. As well, hats were passed and a collection of $13.04 added even more to the occasion. His son Charlie, born when his father was 69 years old, said, that the old man, having slept late on a rainy Saturday morning, opened his eyes and said, Son, I'm going to leave you today. I'm going home. Dropsy was listed as the official cause of death. But Charlie said, far as he knew, Dad just stopped breathing. Isn't that remarkable? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, ready to go. It was his time. Now, after 120 years, he probably was. <laughs> Even though he, he was a man half his age, the doctor thought, roughly. Yeah. Well, just the, the fact that he, you know, he was probably good at what he was doing, and it kept him healthy. Well, he was yeah, outside. He, yeah, but I mean, he but was, he was a, still a rare amazed. bird. Like, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Oh man, that's a. You don't see a lot of those guys walking around. Mm -hmm. You, you would think that that uh, pipe tobacco uh, company would have launched on that. And <laughs> tried right. To, <laughs> tried to sell. It was Prince Albert or what, what yeah, he was doing. Let him know? out of the can. <laughs> oh. Well, it's been nice, John. I'm, I'm glad that we were able to do this and get those things uh, in the can and add this to the archive. Uh, you were an obvious choice on, on the Missoula list for sure. Well, thank you very much, Mark. Yeah. Um, I enjoyed myself. Yeah. Um, and I still want to keep reading. <laughs> well, yeah, and, and, and you will keep writing. Yes, and, yes. Uh, yeah, and that's the other thing. I don't know, you know, we have a whole lot of, uh, I want to try to, to, uh, to, to add as many people as I can in the time that I have to this archive. I just think it's a great idea. It but, is. But, but I also, uh, you know, have the desire to do uh, some repeats, too. So, I mean, maybe we'll get around to that. We'll... We'll see. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, I think after this, I plan on uh, kind of doing like a, a podcast thing. You know what I'm talking about? You oh. Are you a podcast listener? Uh, you know? Yeah, I have occasionally. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, I mean, I it's just, a, you know, listening to things, like listening to the radio, mm -hmm. right? That's what we used to do years and years ago. 
before we got a TV. So anyway, hopefully uh, we can maybe add that uh, second go rounds at least to the podcast. Yeah, let me say something really briefly here about uh, one of the reasons I'm a writer and, and uh, tend to write um, poems that are very descriptive uh, and seen creative is the fact that I grew up on radio. Mm -hmm. I was born in 41 and by 43, 44, we were listening to radio all the time. And right. I can remember some of those programs. Mm -hmm. And I can remember the language creating visual images in my, in my head. Right. I still have them. Oh, yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. It was just wonderful. Yeah. It, it, it posited yeah, I, an energy in, well, in the brain. Um, I, I used to, to sneak over to the neighbors when I was a kid to uh -huh. watch TV because we didn't have one. So, so on a Saturday morning and uh, whenever you were just around my house, it was the radio. I'd yeah. go to the radio. Yeah. Yeah. And, and listen to those programs on the radio. And yeah, exactly. It just fuels the imagination. I wasn't a big reader as a kid. Were you a big reader as no. a kid? No, mm -hmm. I wasn't either. But uh, but I was a big listener. Um, right. And listening to people, conversations. Mm -hmm. Just, uh, yeah. Nosy, as my folks would say. I was nosy. <laughs> Well, it's been a pleasure, John. Thank, Thank you, you, Mark. Yeah. Thank you for doing yeah, this. Yeah, I enjoyed right. myself very much. And we'll, we'll be back again uh, next week with, uh, with another uh, poet in Montana. Thanks for watching. Time filled